Good morning. Good to see you here today. We almost put out a call yesterday to come help us build an ark. But I think we don't need that. Hopefully it's all stopped, but our, I know we needed it, right? We needed the rain, and so thank God for the rain. Good morning. Welcome to all of you here and all those that are joining us at home. We're so excited that you are here, and uh, we would like to share with you that we are ask you to check in on Facebook. If you have your cell phones handy, we'd ask that you'd go uh, and onto your Facebook account, check in, let people know that you are worshiping with us here at Forest Hills. And also, uh, if you are looking for updates on on what's happening in and around the church. Now that we're kind of getting ready for fall, we're gearing up for the fall, we uh, ask that you'd subscribe to weekly updates. Type in your email address and we will make sure that you are added to the list so you can know what's happening in and around the church. Also, if you're looking for an order of worship for today, it can be found on the Church Center app, and we'd ask you to check in there as well. Um, also, if any of you are in need of prayer at any time, we ask that you would go to our website, fhpcusa.org slash prayer, fill in the prayer request. It'll be sent to the deacons and the staff, and we would be honored to pray with you and for you. If you would like to give an offering on your way out, the baskets are there. We would appreciate anything that you can do, or you can, again, on your Church Center app, you can go and you can text the amount you wish to give to 84321 and just fill in the blank, whatever you'd like to do, or simply send in a check to the church office, however you would like to give to the ministry here at the church. Hey, this morning we are celebrating communion today, and if you are watching at home and you would like to participate with us, we'd ask that you would have uh, those elements ready at the end of the service. Our amazing deacons need your help. Uh, they are looking for information on members and family members and families who are in the military as well as in college. They need addresses, emails, birth dates, and graduation dates, any information that you can give that will help them. Please send it to Patty Zimmerman or Kathy Collins, or you can send it right here to the church office and we will make sure that they get it. Today, our golf outing happens, I think, Jim, is that right? We're still on, and I'm guessing pickleball is still on. We're, we're hoping, yeah, so both pickleball and uh, the golf outings are happening this afternoon, and all the information is there on the screen. Now, lastly, here's something I really want to share. I'm so excited about. We're asking you to save the date of September 11th. It is our annual kickoff event that we will be having here during the worship service our chancel choir is going to be singing. Yes, we are so excited about that. We have a guest director who's coming in, um, and we are so excited that uh, if you would like to be a part of that choir, you're going to be notified hopefully by email, and it's going to be an early Sunday morning rehearsal, like 8.30, and then you will sing during the service. Um, also, we're introducing our brand new bulletin that is going to be starting again now on September 11th. And then also following the service, we will head into the fellowship hall and there will be tables again of different ministries happening and you can sign up there's also going to be a drawing for a very very nice gift if you sign up for uh, something in and around the tables you'll hear more about that we are really excited to kick things off here uh, on the 11th of September so please save that second Sunday in September to be here and be part of that celebration now, as we continue in our time of worship, let's come together and offer our hearts and thoughts to God. Let's pray. All-knowing God, we gather together today with praise and thanksgiving for who you are and for all that you have done for us. You know us better than we know ourselves all our thoughts and actions, and yet you love us. No matter where we go or what we do, your love encircles us, ahead and behind, gently leading and guiding and blessing. Lord, we praise you for your love and your faithful presence in our lives. May your spirit move in our hearts and minds this morning as we worship together. 
examine our attitudes, our actions, and lay bare the things we need to confess, and challenge us with your word, and guide us onto paths that lead to life. For we are your people, called by your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we lift our voices to God. Our next song is Amazing Grace, and although it may be a 250-year-old hymn, the lyrics are still relevant even today in our modern times. The truth in these words is timeless, just like our Creator. May this song pour out of our hearts as we sing them to our Heavenly Father.
Good morning. Today's first scripture reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 82, and we hear it from the New International Version. Yep. Good morning. Today's first reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 82, and we hear it from the New International Version. It reads, God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the land of the wicked. The gods know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God. Judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. This is God's word for us today. Let's remain seated as we sing our next hymn. Our next scripture reading today comes from the book of Luke as we're following along in the lectionary throughout the summer. This is Luke 12, beginning at verse 35, talking about watchfulness. Listen again for God's word. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them incline, recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So ends the reading of the gospel this morning. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that we will be ready. Help us this day and beyond to prepare our hearts 
for your return. Lord, bless our time together this hour as we prepare now to hear from you. Lord, let the words of my mouth be acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At the height of the civil rights struggle, Curtis Mayfield, who was this, the lead singer of The Impressions, wrote his most memorable lyrics. I want you to listen to this song. You just thank the Lord. In that turbulent decade, Curtis Mayfield was calling people to a higher purpose. The chaos of the 60s left our nation very much confused from the Six Day War to Vietnam, from the assassination of JFK and Martin Luther King. There were so many reasons to be afraid during those 10 years. But Mayfield, like many others, understood that something great was on the horizon. He could hear it like the distant humming of a diesel engine. You don't need no baggage. All you need is faith. You don't need no ticket. You just get on board. People, he said, get ready. Over the next 35 years, many others have done covers of Mayfield's song, and now I think I understand why it has such mass appeal, especially in today's world with wars and rumors of wars, political infighting and mass shootings. It's crazy. It's literally crazy around here sometimes. So there is something so, so true, so very positive and ominous about that song. You see, it is the very same message that Jesus is giving to his disciples. They are to be ready. They are not to be afraid. They are to sell their possessions. You don't need no baggage. They are to be dressed for service and ready to open the door when the master returns. The train is coming. One day, Jesus will return, and we must be ready. But how are we to prepare ourselves for that? And so the answer to that question, I think we must look closely at the text that we just read for three different ways for people, the people of God, us, to get ready. First, we have to get ready by watching for the Master's return. The second coming of Jesus is such a touchy subject for the church, especially in mainstream, mainline Protestant churches. For some of us, we wonder what in the world has taken him so long to come back. Many have tried to figure out when he is coming back. They've made predictions, but every single one of them have been disappointed. William Miller, in the late 1700s, studying the books of Daniel and Revelation, predicted that March 21st of 1844 was the date, the precise date, when Christ would return to the earth. When that day came and went, without the promised appearance of Christ, Miller changed his prediction to October 22nd, 1844. It came and went. Many of his followers deserted him. But many stuck around, and you know them today as Seventh-day Adventists, a Christian church, but founded on a very shaky beginning. Hal Lindsey, in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, sold over 30 million copies, predicted in his book that 40 years after the establishment of Israel, Jesus would return to earth, and seven years after that return, the church would be raptured to heaven. Now, the problem is this. Israel was established in 1948 as a country. Christ should have returned then in 1988, and the church raptured in 1995. 
Well, I have a little news for you folks. If this is heaven, we're in a lot of trouble. Would you not agree? In 1997, Hal Lindsey was forced to change his prediction. Evangelist Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson have both predicted the end was coming and both were wrong. Harold Camping, president of Family Radio, predicted the world was going to end in September of 1994. Grant Jeffrey wrote a popular book called Armageddon, stating that the year 2000 was the most likely date of the world's end. Now that we are coming to the end of 2022, hopefully most of these doom and gloomers will give it a rest. But I'm not holding my breath. The question raised is this, what did Jesus mean when he told us to watch? If charting and, and planning and dating is not his meaning, well, then what is? And that question brings us to the second way people are to get ready. We are to get ready not by predicting a date, but by getting rid of our fears. Now, don't think for a moment that Jesus has some Pollyanna view of the world here. He knows just as well as many of us that there is plenty wrong with the world and not much is really going to get much better. He is also not suggesting that Christians will be immune to suffering. Rather, he is asking his followers to, to adopt a way of life that is not rooted in the securities of this world. So let's look at the context of this entire section of Scripture for its meaning. Jesus had just finished dealing with a young man who was jealous because his brother was getting two-thirds of his, of his father's estate. He was only getting a third. We talked about this a few weeks ago, if you were here. This jealous young man wanted Jesus to preside over his case and resolve the matter once and for all. He wanted half. He wanted a secure future. He wanted Jesus to turn the table of custom Jewish customs in his favor. And Jesus said, no, I, I am not your lawyer, young man, but I will give you a piece of advice. He said, watch out. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Now, it seems to many of us that it would only be fair that the brothers split it, receive, each receive half, but Jesus doesn't see it that way. He turns to him and tells him a parable about a rich man who had a great crop, but he stored it all for just himself. And that night, his very soul was required of him. On that night that he built all of his big, huge barns and secured his future, he died. He doesn't get to eat one grain of corn that he has stored. And then Jesus says, it is better to be rich toward God. Jesus then turns away from this young man. He now addresses his disciples. He says this, this, this fellow is worried about his life, and he's worried about how it's all going to turn out. And he says to his disciples, look, I don't want you to worry about that. I don't want you to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what you're going to wear. And then he says, consider the ravens, consider of the air and the lilies of the field. He says, doesn't God take care of these? And how much more valuable are you than they? I don't want you to worry about any of that. Most of our life, we spend worrying about our own security. But what would happen to those insecurities if we suddenly sold everything we had and gave it to the poor? Now, I, I'm not convinced that um, our worldview would be, well, yes, it would be. It would be different, I think. We would then turn to the needs of others. We would come to rely and depend on God for everything that we needed, for our most basic daily necessities. That's what would happen if we sold everything and gave it to the poor. Now, let me say this. I don't think that God is asking you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. I can see the relief on some of your faces. Let me share with you one of the struggles that I have as a pastor. 
as I read scripture, I come upon some of these very difficult sayings of Jesus, like, like this one. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. And measuring my life against that standard, I would have to say that I have failed and failed miserably. I would suspect that measuring any of our lives up against that standard, we probably all would have failed. None of us fulfill this command of Jesus. But I don't think that it is the standard for all Christians. I think it was a standard for the disciples of the time. God does ask certain people to sell everything that they have because they are being called into Christian mission. And I am sure that God still asks that of people even today. But I don't find Jesus making that standard with everyone that he meets. We all know the story of Zacchaeus, right? We're all familiar with his small stature, him climbing the sycamore tree. We remember that. But how many of us remember his tall stature with his attitude and what happened in his home that night? Reading into that, out of the blue, during the meal, he turns to Jesus, he says, I'm going to sell everything that I own and I'm going to give it to the poor. And if I've wronged anyone, I am going to give back to them fourfold. You remember what Jesus says? His response, he doesn't say that you have to sell everything, Zacchaeus. You don't. He said to him, no greater faith exists in all of Israel. There is a standard. There is a standard, but it is not selling everything that you have. Here is the standard. How much time do you spend, ask yourselves this question, how much time do you spend worrying about storing up for yourselves treasures on earth? And how much time do you spend storing up treasures in heaven? If the scales are tipping toward heaven, then I think you are meeting Jesus' standard. Where are the scales tipping for you? And then that brings us to the third way that the people of God are to be ready or to get ready. We are to get ready through service, through service. For all the words that we use to describe Christian behavior, there is none better than servant. So let's look at this rather short but remarkable parable together. The master has left to go to a wedding banquet way for the the servants of the master to know when he is going to come back. It could be that night. It could be the next, it could be three days from now. They don't know because weddings in Jewish culture, they were week long going to stay. If the wine held out and the celebrations were still going on, they were lively enough, he could be there all week. But the servants were not privy to knowing the master's plan. They are simply to be ready when he knocks on the door. Now, on the surface, this is, this is a rather routine story. Everyone listening would have understood the, the word picture that Jesus told. But there's a remarkable twist, really, to the end of the story, and, and it involves a role reversal. Jesus says, it is good for those servants who are watching and meet their master at the door. Now, that makes sense. Right? I mean, the master will have certain needs when he comes home, when he is met at his castle. They must feed him if he's hungry. They must help him unpack. They must give an accounting of what they've done since he has been gone. Because if they're not ready, trouble is. And this, this makes sense. But it's not how the story ends. It isn't. At the end of verse 37, it is not the servants who wait on the master. It is the master who waits on the servants. Now that's different, isn't it? A little odd 
even we might say, it, it will be good for those servants who are ready for the master, not because there is this, this threat of punishment for unalert behavior, but because there is the promise of a lavish master who graciously upon his return treats and gives to the servants. He gives to the servants, sets them down, and serves them. It's quite a different picture that we have of a master and a servant. One where the, the rewards are great, the beyond measure, and grace is abundant. That's the kind of promise that our Lord has given us upon his return. He will sit us down at his banquet table and satisfy the needs of us, all of us, his servants. There's a story of a famous businessman who has a net worth of over $3 billion. One day, his man, this man's limousine broke down on the Garden State Parkway on the way home from Atlantic City during a weekend excursion. An unemployed auto mechanic stopped to rescue him, and he succeeded in fixing the limousine and getting it up and running, but he refused to take payment for fixing the limo. The wealthy man was so impressed that the next day he sent flowers to the mechanic's wife along with a certified letter stating that the man's mortgage had been paid in full. He was asked about this in an interview and asked him to deny or confirm the story, but he didn't give any details on what he did for this good Samaritan mechanic. And I thought to myself, what a great deal that would be, wouldn't it, if someone really rich would take care of all of us? Wouldn't that be great? If you, if you knew that there was someone with a vast wealth out there that would gladly help you, you could be free from many a worry. You, you would have financial security. But I think unless your name is Hilton or Kardashian, it's not likely. That kind of security, it's hard to come by. But how good it will be when out of the vast wealth of our Father's grace, the Lord returns and we, his servants, are asked to sit down and be served by the Master. Just like we will at this table in a few minutes. People, get ready. There's a train a-coming. You don't need no baggage. You just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. Don't need no ticket. You just thank the Lord. My friends, are you ready? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to be in worship this morning. We come together to celebrate the joys and surround each other. And we are grateful. Lord, in the scripture reading this morning, you tell us not to be afraid of what the future holds, not to worry about tomorrow, but you also know how difficult we find it to heed those words because we worry. We worry about so many things. Our families, our friends, our circumstances, the wars that surround us, the pain and suffering of so many people. Some worries are big worries, but most worries are tiny concerns in the grand scheme of things. We come before you this day with these big and tiny worries and with confidence, we know we can lay them at your feet. 
We bring our big worries about health and happiness and security for ourselves and for our loved ones. We bring big worries about the world that we live in and its future existence as we continue to fail to address so many ecological problems. We bring big worries about the way people in our world are treated as less than human, exploited, tortured, helpless, and abused. We bring the worries of war and the suffering of many. Father God, we know that you are concerned with every aspect of our lives. And so we also bring the little things that concern us, the worries which keep us awake at night, the worries which only you know. And so, Lord, in this time of silence that we offer to you now, hear our prayers, both big and small, but of concern to each and every one of us. Lord, hear our prayer. Living God, reach out to all those for whom the future brings fears and uncertainties. Assure them that you are with them, even when that future seems dark and circumstances feel like they are spiraling out of control. Remind them that you are able to transform even the bleakest of situations bringing healing and wholeness. Lord, we make our prayers in faith because we know that your Spirit is at work in our world, making all things new, and we are grateful. Open our eyes to see and our hearts to know that you are here. Now, O oh God, hear us as we speak aloud the prayer that Jesus taught us all to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you, Take, eat, all of you. Do this, he said, and remember me. And then he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins for many, for all, for you. Take, drink, all of you. Do this and remember me. This morning we serve communion by method of intinction. When the elders are up front, we invite you at your leisure to come up the center aisle, make, form two lines, take a piece of bread and the cup, partake of it, and there are receptacles on the way back to your seats via the side aisles. If you are not able to come forward, just remain in the pew. I will be walking around, and it would be my honor to serve you in the pews. We also have gluten-free wafers available if you prefer. This is the table of our Lord, prepared and now ready for you.
This is the table of our Lord, prepared for us. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for these elements. And we pray that they would help us to get ready, prepared to answer the door when you knock. In all the different ways we are asked to get ready, open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to heed the call. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'd invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn together. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.